This is the second film from our Bristol workshop about understanding adult ADHD. Professor Philip Asherson is a leading academic in the field of ADHD, based at the Institute of Psychiatry in London. In this video, he describes the knowledge we have about what is known about the genetics of ADHD and how it presents in adults. These clips are new, and we would like to know what you think. Dr. Ove Spadat, a member of the UK Adult ADHD Network, UCAN, is collecting your responses as part of research into interactive online training. Click the link that appears below the clip to participate in the two-minute survey. All information collected is anonymous. So I'm going to um, uh, give an overview of um, epidemiological findings in ADHD, and particularly focusing on ADHD in childhood and then its sort of life course trajectory um, forwards into adulthood. Um, I'll talk about the prevalence of ADHD, um, some studies looking at the persistence into adulthood, and then I'll touch on genetic epidemiology, basically family and twin studies. Um, what do we know about comorbidity in population samples and in clinical samples? Um, and then touch on um, how we can also use epidemiological approaches to help us think about causal processes and understand those in, in a bit more detail. So, as men, most of you will know, ADHD is currently defined by sets of symptoms. Um, currently we're using the DSM-4. You know, not so many people use the IDC-10. I think hyperkinetic disorder is quite a restricted definition, but it does describe a, a kind of more severe form of combined type ADHD. And in the NICE guidelines for children, they say that's the type of ADHD you should treat with medication immediately because it's so severe. But DSM-4 is a much broader uh, concept. And there are these lists of, um, of um, symptoms, but they're really more like signs because they're very behavioural. Um, a lot of them were based on observing child behaviour. Um, so one of the advances in DSM-5 will be giving a little more description as to how these symptoms translate through into adult behaviours. Um, um, but there's a list of nine of them. And I mean, of course, there are many other symptoms. I just want to touch a little bit on that um, during my talk. But of course, these symptoms are used to define the disorder. But that doesn't, <coughs> that doesn't sort of mean that they're the only types of symptoms or problems that people with ADHD have. But they have proved to be quite effective. Um, you know, they have high utility because, for example, you know, they, they, are, they, they, they predict a very good drug response, for example. And they have been used very effectively in research as a predictor of a whole range of problems and impairments and outcomes. So they, they certainly are very useful. But, you know, like everything, we, we mustn't be sort of completely tied down to, under, you know, the DSM or, or any classificatory system. So you need six or more inattentive symptoms, six or more hyperactive impulsive symptoms. That's the kind of key criteria. Um, when you're sort of deciding if somebody has a symptom or not, you've got to look at its developmental relevance. You know, is it maladaptive and inconsistent with the developmental level? Um, and you have to look at the age of onset. And in the DSM-4, it says that some symptoms should begin before age seven. Not the full syndrome, but some of the symptoms with impairment. Um, and, then it, uh, and then there's this idea of pervasiveness that these symptoms, you know, they don't, they're not just occurring in one environment, they're with you all the time, so they should be present in two or more settings. In children, that's typically school and, school and at home. And the symptoms um, should be impairing. And we'll come on to sort of why impairment is such a critical criteria. Um, I mean, it doesn't really reflect um, a disease process as such. I mean, it's the sort of outcome. Um, and I suppose you could have a high level of symptoms and be quite well adjusted. But impairment is, is a key criterion thinking of, of, um, of sort of from a, a more practical approach. You know, do you have a condition that needs treating? And sort of defining those impairments is very important to that. And of course, we'd like to know that the symptoms don't, um, are not due to something else. They're not only occurring secondary to our psychosis or... Um, I mean, autism was a big one, because in the old criteria it said you can't have ADHD in autism. But I think now that people realise that you can often have ADHD in autism, so that criteria is, it will no longer apply. Um, 
Um, I think there was a question about schizophrenia, and we did a survey in um, in um, uh, secure mental health settings at Broadmoor and also in Riverhouse in London. And about two thirds of the patients in those settings have basically a psychotic illness. You know, most of them have schizophrenia. Some of them have bipolar. But the rates of ADHD among the psychotic group was really tiny. Um, and what was contrasting was in those populations they have another group of people where the primary diagnosis is a severe personality disorder. And within that group that's where you saw a lot of ADHD. But it, I found it quite reassuring that within the two-thirds that had basically a psychotic illness there were very low rates of ADHD. They scored reasonably high on rating scales if you ask them to fill in ADHD rating scales, but when you did a careful diagnostic interview, the, the rates sort of went right down. So it doesn't seem to be um, sort of like an epiphenomena that could easily be an outcome of psychosis. If you see the two together, it probably is ADHD. So on, on, in the DSM-5, there are a number of changes that are being discussed, and the only ones that are actually going to be implemented are put stars against. Um, but there was a lot of discussion about whether the symptom threshold should be altered. Um, and the idea was that instead of having a threshold of six symptoms, they would allow you to have four symptoms. And the reason for that is um, um, there is good research showing that um, if, you, if you sort of look about, at the number of symptoms in adulthood that give rise to impairment, four turns out to be quite a good criteria. Most people who had ADHD as a child and maybe only have four in one domain as an adult, you know, still have significant impairment. But still, I think the committee were concerned that, um, that there are groups who actually have quite a weak criteria for childhood. So in principle, you might get people who, who had weak evidence of ADHD as a child, had four symptoms as an adult, and you'd be greatly broadening the prevalence. So I think for those reasons, they, they didn't bring it in. But it was certainly, it's an important concept. You, don't nest, you could be sub-threshold to the criteria and still have significant ADHD that needs treating. The other area was they noticed that um, there's actually not much, um, there, there is only a few impulsivity items within the criteria, although many adults present with a range of um, expressions of impulsivity. Um, and so sort of partly one of the possible reasons why hyperactivity and impulsivity declines in adulthood is because we're not... We're, we're, we're not really accurately measuring it or, or picking it up within the criteria. Um, so they were thinking of increasing the number of items, but I think that um, was untested and unvalidated, and so it was an important area of thinking, but they, they decided not to do that. Um, so the things they did change were giving more adult descriptions of ADHD behaviours, and so that, that sort of helps. But there are, man, there are many uh, publications that also highlight these things and UCAN has actually, uh, we're on the verge of publishing a book which is very much a clinician's handbook. So we hope that it's the sort of thing that um, if you're new to ADHD you, it'll, it'll have all the information you need in there about ADHD and the way it presents and how to manage it and treat it. Age of onset, um, I think uh, there has actually been an accumulation of research over the years which essentially showed that this age of onset of seven was, uh, turned out to be quite arbitrary. Um, and there was, there, there wasn't, it wasn't very empirically based. And when they compared groups with an apparent age of onset somewhere between 7 and 12 and those with an onset below 7, it actually made no difference to the overall clinical picture and the, the, um, the treatment effect sizes. Um, and so they've altered this to um, age 12. And the other difference is they're, they're no longer requiring impairment in childhood. So the new criteria will say you could have symptoms before age 12, but not necessarily impaired. And I think the reason for that is um, because at least with some um, relatively high-functioning cases, they can be quite well managed within the sort of families. If you've got good family structures, um, sort of good, good support within the schools, you can be quite well managed. And then the problems really start when you leave home, or as you're getting older and tasks and life gets more complex, and that's when the impairments start to become much more obvious and apparent. So it kind of allows those people um, to come into the diagnosis. And as I said, the overlap with autism is now very well recognised. There's many published papers on this, and so actually it's a common comorbidity. And it's not that it's, uh, um, you know, it's one of the things one should be looking out for, 
when screening people with ADHD are these neurodevelopmental problems, and particularly autism. So what do we know about the prevalence of ADHD? And uh, this is probably the most cited paper. It's really covering the prevalence in childhood, not in adulthood. And the bottom line from this um, is that um, from a review, um, it's, it's basically a review article of meta-analysis, and they, they pick out the best papers using some strict criteria. And they, there's actually 102 studies, and they come down to an average prevalence of 5%. Um, as you can see, there's not much movement around the, the risk ratio there. It's very similar between Europe and the US. Um, and you can see there's a, there's a few studies where it's, it appears that there are these big effect sizes, but actually, you know, these are very inaccurate estimates in South America and Africa. Um, the only really significant differences from Europe and North America are in Asia and in the Middle East, where these are sort of uh, statistically lower but nevertheless, quite high rates. I mean, they're, they're about three, three to four percent, not five percent in um, Asia and um, in the Middle East. So that's that's um, sort of what's happening in children. You can see there's an age effect as well. Um, so a higher prevalence in children, a lower prevalence as you're getting older, and also a gender effect. So although the average is five percent, um, at least um, the summary from these studies is a ten percent in males and um, sort of less, sort of a lower value in females, so um, sort of very much higher um, in boys than in girls. And of course, that is reflected in child clinics, um, many of which are sort of 80% boys and only 20% girls. And that ratio does seem to change, you know, as you go into adult clinics. A lot of women come forward, and there's a lot of discussion as to why the ratio is changing as you get older. And it might reflect comorbidities. You know, boys have more disruptive behaviours. They come to the attention of, of people more easily and, and, and come into treatment for those reasons, particularly if they're being oppositional or difficult. You know, maybe girls, um, are sort of, um, their problems are more in the domain of the inattention, the disorganisation. They're less likely to develop very disruptive behaviours. But I think it's still an interesting area um, um, to, to sort of, to, to understand that more fully. In the UK, the rates um, traditionally have tended to come up rather more conservatively. And this is the national survey um, done by Ford and Goodman and others using the Dorber interview. And so they effectively find a sort of an overall rate of ADHD of about 3.6% in males, 0.9% in females. So sort of lower, really, than, than the average effects in the, in the uh, other studies. Um, ADHD, the combined type, is the most common, then the inattentive type. And the hyperactive impulsive subtype is really quite rare um, as, as a diagnosis. And that really does quite well reflect the, the proportions that you get in child clinics. Um, and you can see there's some sort of age, age effects here, but still quite, quite persistent at 13 to 15. That's when this, this study stopped. So that's what's happening in the uh, UK. So one of the issues with these, um, one of the other changes in the DSM-5 I didn't mention is that they've really moved away from this concept of subtypes. And because it kind of gives you the impression that, that you've got these very different, different entities that perhaps have no relationship to each other. But actually they're, they're really going to think of them as clinical presentations. And part of that is because for most people, you can begin as a hyperactive impulsive subtype when you're an infant. In middle childhood, you're combined type, and as an adult, you're inattentive type. And I mean, that's what the, the sort of epidemiological data shows, you know, this sort of transition from hyperactive predominantly as a child and then to inattentive predominantly as an, as an adult. So there are sort of clearly interesting processes that, that um, um, affect the balance between the, the, these two domains of ADHD. Um, and when you look at these studies, you know, there is quite, across all the individual studies, there is a massive range of prevalence rates cited, and that does bother some people. You've got 2% in one study and 20% in another, and how do you really rationalise that? Um, but the meta-analysis sort of, sort, of, sort of pinned down the key problems, and one is really the requirement for impairment. If you don't take impairment into account, you will get much higher prevalence rates. Um, the criteria make a difference. In fact, the DSM-4 um, gives you a higher prevalence than either the ICD-10 or the older 
DSM-3R. Um, so that's sort of partly why you might see prevalence rates go up as you move from the old criteria to the newer criteria. The source of data affects it. If you go purely by what parents and teachers say, say if they're filling in a rating scale, you're going to get a much higher prevalence than, than um, investigators gathering the data and forming a, uh, their own opinion as experts as to what symptoms are actually present or not. Um, and if you have studies that rely on screening rates, particularly within clinical populations, what we found is typically whatever the screening rate is, when you do a careful diagnostic interview, you roughly half the prevalence. So we found that, for example, in our um, addiction clinic, that there was a rate of around um, 25 or 30 percent at the screening level, but after doing careful diagnostic interviews, we came out with 12 percent of people in the SLAM addiction clinics had, had, a, had a, a carefully made diagnosis of ADHD. Um, so it's, it's very well documented that as you grow older, you know, the prevalence rate sort of does drop using the current criteria. And the, the paper that probably summarises that best is Steve Farrow's meta-analysis. So it's a few years old now. Um, but a, um, a, a number of, a lot, uh, I think it's around 10 studies went into this that had, had accumulated data over the years. Um, and they actually used the older DSM-3 criteria which, as I said, was a little bit stricter than DSM-4. And they found that 15% retained the full diagnosis by the age of 25. But uh, what was a very important further point was that 50% were in this um, sort of partial remission group where they didn't quite meet the symptom thresholds, but actually they had persistence of ADHD symptoms still causing impairment. So overall, from this study, you could still think that around two-thirds you know, had persistence of ADHD symptoms causing a problem in adulthood. Um, and that seems to sort of map reasonably well onto the, the um, overall prevalence rates in adult studies. Um, and we, uh, we've actually followed up our own sample of combined type children. Um, and I was, um, I don't know if I was surprised or not, but what we actually found was a much higher rate of persistence than that reported in other studies. So these are children in the UK who had combined type ADHD. And when we followed them up, sort of on average six years later, um, um, I haven't actually put the age range on this slide, but we followed them up six years later, and what you're seeing is that in sort of young adulthood, um, we're still seeing 80% of them meeting full criteria for ADHD. So you can see that there's been a shift in the subtypes. They were all combined type of um, when we first saw them, but now about um, a third of them have combined type and another third of inattentive type. And then a small number fall into these hyperactive and sub-threshold groups. So really high rates of persistence. Um, and you can see this sort of change in the symptom profiles in epidemiological samples. This is a large population twin sample from Sweden. And what you're seeing here are the hyperactivity and pulsivity symptoms um, as you're going from 8 to 9 and then up to 16 <coughs> to 17. So you can see this clear decline. You know, the boys have slightly more of these symptoms than the girls, but they're declining with age. But here you have the inattentive symptoms, and you can see the persistence. Um, there's really no change here at all in either the boys or the girls as, as you're getting older. And uh, so if you, there are other data sets that now take this further forward into adulthood, and they affect, uh, they, they basically show, show these, um, these trends continuing. Um, a lot of the work, um, um, a paper that's often reported in terms of the prevalence in adults is the Kessler study, which was basically a sort of national survey of all psychiatric disorders, including ADHD. And the way they did it is they did a screen for ADHD, and then they asked, um, they asked the question whether, if you had any of these ADHD symptoms as a child, did it persist into adulthood? And so that, that was all the data they had. But they took a subsample and then did careful diagnostic interviews and kind of worked out some probabilities that these different categories had ADHD. And so if you didn't have a, if you had a negative childhood screen and no persistence in adulthood, none of them turned out to have ADHD when interviewed. Um, if you had sub-threshold criteria as a child, about 7%, only 7% had ADHD. 
But if you had the full criteria as a child, you, answer, you said there wasn't persistence into adulthood, but still it turned out that 36% had ADHD. And then if you had the double thing of having full criteria as a child, you said that um, the, the symptoms persisted into adulthood, then about 84% had ADHD as a child. So sort of based on that data, they, from a larger sample, they then sort of estimated that in the US, roughly 4.4% had ADHD as an adult. Um, other meta-analyses, um, that, that was a single study, but sort of using multiple sites. Um, um, uh, Sim Simmons et al. did a meta-analysis. There's another one from Fayed et al. shows fairly similar data. Um, they, they were quite strict in, in, in the way they selected studies. So, for example, this, the Kessler study isn't in this meta-analysis. But they estimated that it was about 2.5%, you know, with, with somewhere between 2 and 3%. Uh, for DSM-4 ADHD in adults. You can see there's a little bit of variation. Most of it is down to methodology. Um, but, you know, I think overall we can be fairly confident we're seeing rates of 2 to 3%, perhaps higher in some populations in, in adulthood. So David's already touched on this, but uh, really thinking about the treatment prevalence, you know, how many people are diagnosed and treated. <coughs> I mean, the, the data that David showed, and this, this is from the same group, um, and, and sort of one limitation of these analyses is they're dependent upon um, G, um, um, databases in, gen, in primary care. So they don't actually reflect any additional prescribing that could be going on in secondary care. Um, but you can see that, um, I mean, this is year by year, you can see this sort of massive uh, sort of uptake of treatment um, that's, that's going on. But still here you've got about um, eight, eight in a thousand people being treated. So it's still quite low treatment rates in, relatively low treatment rates in um, the UK. If you, if you did a similar study in the US, I have a slide of that I'm not going to show you, but it's actually about 10%, whereas here it's less than 1%, or well, 10% for boys. Um, but here, as you can see, it's, it's uh, less than 1%. But then you've got this sort of complete sort of tail off that can't be explained by the natural course of the clinical disorder. And, um, um, and again, you're seeing you know, year by year this massive increase. But this, mass, this increase in uptake of, of treating ADHD is not paralleled in the, in the older age groups. You know, there, there's an interaction here. There's no effect in these older, older people. And, and this is the same slide that David showed. In fact, this line here was based on the Throne meta-analysis. So it was kind of assuming a rate of 15% persistence by the age of 25. But then if you look at my data, which is showing really much <coughs> higher prevalence rates, this is quite a conservative figure. So it's just a, a general point, but this may actually be sort of underestimating the, the, difference, the differences in, in that group. And I think Eric Taylor pointed, has pointed out over the years, and he, he did some research back in 1996, that showed it depends a, a little bit on having a comparative group because um, you know it is true that as you get older you do have less you are more as you get older you're more attentive you, you have more self-control that's true for anyone it's true for if you've got ADHD or if you don't um, and it and so you really need to look at the age the, the differences at different ages and what Eric really showed was sort of more or less two parallel lines and only there, there is some catching up in some people but, you know, for many people, you know, the differences between cases and causes retained at these different ages. So it's, you have to think of it really relative to your peer group and how you're functioning in relation to, you know, to, to, your, to your peers. Um, family studies have been going on for a while. Um, um, a lot of it was done in Mass General Hospital by Biedemann and Ferron and colleagues. Um, but, and, but some of the very early researchers in the field were doing family studies and, and so it's been recognised for many years that it tends to run in families. And the sort of rates in first degree relatives, um, it depends a bit on the study. In the US they used sort of uh, these broader criteria and so you do get higher control rates. Um, so this is looking at the risk to a parent of a child with ADHD and so there's a roughly five-fold risk um, in these parents. Um, this is a study from Steve Ferone's group. And this is looking at the risk to the siblings in, in, the same, um, in these same families. It was about fourfold. Um, but in our study in the UK, if we take a, a, this more restricted definition, if we focus on the most severe combined type group, 
you can see actually the, the odds are much higher. This is a tenfold risk among first degree relatives. Um, but of course, what's being inherited is not necessarily just the clinical disorder. And, and, and what um, genetic epidemiology has really showed is that ADHD is, is sort of the tail of a continuous distribution. And so if you look at the siblings of somebody with ADHD, they may, they may or may not have ADHD, but they're very likely to have higher rates of ADHD symptoms than, than the normal population. So there's a kind of link between, it's really a, a, a trait that's carried in the population that you, and, and if you go above a certain threshold, then, then you may have the clinical disorder. And um, there'll be many twin studies, and, and uh, it just shows how consistent these are, showing heritabilities of about 80%. Um, and um, uh, there was some concern, um, or, or, or um, we weren't quite sure what was going on with adults, because the first few studies that came out showed heritabilities of about 30 or 35 percent. They seemed to be about half or less than half what we were seeing in children. And it seems that the reason for that is because they relied totally on self-report. And in fact, if you do <coughs> self-report in children, uh, curiously, you actually get a slightly higher heritability, but it's a lot less than if you take a parent or a teacher's report. Um, and, um, and, and that's what you see in the adult data. If you take self-report in this study, the heritabilities are about 50%. This is going from age 14, and then this group here is age 20. But if you take parent reports, it's 60 to 70%, which is very similar to the child literature. And, and if you combine the two together, which sort of will give you a more accurate measure, you, you end up with a heritability of about 80%. So I think overall, it does look very similar. And you can use genetic epidemiology to look at the links, the genetic links across time. And what they essentially show is that a large part of uh, the genetic effects, although not all of them, are very stable. So about half the genetic effects on ADHD sort of seem to act sort of right across the lifespan as you go from childhood through into adulthood. But there are sort of new effects that come in at different ages. And so it does just suggest that there are sort of newly developing processes that perhaps modify you know, the outcomes and the course of the disorder, you know, as, as you get older. So there are probably interesting reasons, uh, you know, why some people get better and for others it's a very persistent condition. Um, but these, these sorts of heritability studies essentially are using, are looking at correlations in the general population. So they're not focusing on concordance rates for the clinical disorder. They're, they're taking ADHD symptoms in a population sample and looking at correlations in identical and non-identical twins. And it just um, really sort of shows that it is a remarkably sort of reliable set of measures, it, it giving you these NZ twin correlations of 76%. Um, this is from teacher ratings. And it's sort of half that for DZs. And that's why you get these very high heritabilities. Um, and so overall, what, what we're really, what these studies are telling us is that ADHD, you know, is, is a continuous trait. I mean, it, so it becomes a little bit arbitrary where we draw this line. Um, and so that's why the impairment criteria, as well as severity of symptoms, really comes into it. Um, there probably are unique causes of ADHD, you know, severe early deprivation, um, um, copy number variants, you know, seem to have a big the uh, major causes of ADHD in some individuals, but for the majority, they're, they're representing the tail of this normal distribution. Um, but I think the other thing we've learned from genetic epidemiology is it's, it's not just one syndrome. It's sort of, in a way, there are two key domains. There may actually be more. Um, and the two key domains are the obvious ones, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention. And they partially overlap. At the genetic level, they share about 60% of their genes. And so there are unique effects on each. Um, and this does have some clinical relevance if you look at the relationship of ADHD to reading disability. Um, what you see is that reading disability has a much higher relationship to inattention than it does to hyperactivity and impulsivity. And this is the phenotypic relationship at the clinical level. And this is um, in terms of the, the numbers, the proportion of genes that are shared. Well, you could take another phenotype like um, oppositional behaviour. And here what you see is very strong relationships to hyperactivity and impulsivity and a much weaker relationship to inattention. Um, and that's at the phenotypic level, the genetic level, and also in terms of environmental correlates. 
So actually, oppositional behaviour is sort of very much core to ADHD. It's very tightly linked in with hyperactivity and impulsivity symptoms. Um, I thought I'd have a brief interlude, because I know I was throwing a lot of data at you. Um, a few years ago, we, uh, we ran a competition, or um, sort of it was helped by one of the uh, pharma companies. And so we held an exhibition, and uh, these are just some slides from adults with ADHD. It's, sort of, um, it's got all sorts of comorbidities and emotionality, anxiety, you're lazy, he's stupid. You know, it's sort of what's going on in this guy's head. Um, that, that was the winning one, actually. Um, this one I, I quite like, it's sort of like spaghetti head. <laughs> I mean, it very much reflects the sort of the experience that people with ADHD have. It's sort of very sort of distracted sort of set of thoughts and sort of multiple thoughts all going on at the same time. You know pick up kids. I'm just ordinary every day things, but in a very haphazard, disorganised way. And the last one, which I think personally I find I, I rather like this one, but it's this idea all these buttons are on full. And so you've got traffic noise, just different thoughts, <coughs> creativity, laughter. But people with ADHD often struggle with filtering out. But it's a bit like having everything sort of on full blast all the time, sort of Anyway, this is, this, uh, these are representations from people with ADHD, so it's a nice set of, of uh, images. Right, back to the data. Um, so comorbidity, um, I mean, that's, that's obviously a huge topic. I mean, we know from um, uh, epidemiological population surveys that there are high rates of other conditions. And this is from the US survey from Kessler. And these are actually the odds ratios. So these are the um, compared to the normal population rates. And I've put them into groups. Th these are sort of depressive disorders. So having any kind of mood disorder is about five times more likely in ADHD than the uh, population control. Um, and then it's particularly high for dysthymia. Bipolar disorder is high. But it's a very controversial area. And we recently wrote a a paper on it, and I don't think I actually know all the answers to exactly how you differentiate one from the other. I kind of think I know the answers, but other experts have different opinions from me. And it's one of those fields where, where actually you've got two schools of thought and they really clash head on, and it's, it's an unresolved issue. And so we still need to do some good research. But for sure, uh, one of the interesting findings is that if you, even if you compare to other comorbidities, there's a greater association with bipolar over and above the kind of general background comorbidity that all psychiatric disorders have. So it does seem to have a specific link to bipolar, but it, it definitely needs more, more research. Um, I mean, dysthymia seems to me it sort of overlaps with sort of low self-esteem, which is very common in ADHD. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that's sort of the, the accumulation of negative life events over, over, over throughout your childhood is going to have these... Um, chronic effects on your mood over time, perhaps. So anxiety, um, different forms of anxiety are increased. Not OCD. Um, um, if they were non-significant, I just defaulted them to an odds ratio of one, but um, I think it was higher, but, but it wasn't significant. Um, um, and then alcohol and drug abuse, curiously, didn't come out as significant. Drug dependence did. So it could be alcohol dependence, but not not alcohol use or drug, drug use. But it might be that the rates of alcohol and drug use are so high in the States that you know, <laughs> it doesn't make much difference if you've got ADHD or not. Um, and here, any substance use disorder. So certainly serious addiction. You know, there's a, a, an eight-fold increased risk of drug dependence in these studies. Um, but when you go into clinical samples, I suppose what's most notable, I think, is, is you, do get a, you do get high rates of these comorbid disorders, although these studies don't have um, sort of population controls for, for you to contrast against. So perhaps it's a bit it's slightly unclear you know, how much greater these are. But these are the obvious things you'd expect, mood disorders, drug abuse, anxiety, antisocial personality, borderline personality problems. So all of these are increased in clinical samples, people turning up at clinics. But what's very prominent is a high level of other types of symptoms. So these are not meeting any particular diagnostic criteria, but they have high levels of mood symptoms, particularly mood dysregulation, you know, anger outbursts, uh, sensation-seeking behaviours, 
sleep disrupted sleep patterns, you know, the initial insomnia and sleep patterns. Almost everybody with ADHD has that for 60% in this study. Some anxiety, aggression, and some other symptoms. It's a very symptomatic disorder with, with a lot of other um, comorbidities or at the, at the sort of symptom level, not just at the disorder level. And, and in our own work, we were, we were quite interested to try and get a bit more to grips th with this. But, so, you know, course, these could be caused because you've also got another condition. So we really wanted to know how much of it is due to ADHD itself and not due to other conditions. So one way we went about that was by um, collecting a sample of men with ADHD that really had no comorbidities. And we had to screen these people very carefully. And so we actually screened 508 people. We ended up with a final sample of 41. So this is the, this is the atypical uh, non-comorbid group. No drug use or dependency, no depression, no major anxiety problems. Um, so, you know, it's less than 10%. But, you know, how much other psychopathology do they have? Um, and actually quite a lot. And, and so these bars, actually these are, um, I think these are all significant. I haven't put the stars on them. But, you know, like the other slide, they have um, somatic symptoms, fatigue. Clearly they're going to have concentration problems, forgetfulness, sleep problems, irritability, worrying about their health, depression, depressive thoughts. Um, this is from the CISR, which is used in national surveys in, in the UK the ONS survey, so they're, they're sort of population data to, you can compare this with, although they're not on this slide. So very symptomatic, and that's really what comes over in the clinic. The, the disorder, you know, does contain a wide range of other symptoms, many of which get better when you treat them with stimulants. And we were being particularly sort of struck by the levels of emotional ability that people with ADHD present with. Um, and so in this study where people don't have comorbidities, you see there's much higher rates of mood lability um, on these um, scales that we use. These are sort of validated scales of sort of mood changing frequently and often um, in, in different domains. Um, and we could also control for those sub-threshold symptoms, the ones I showed you in the previous slide. And even when you control for them statistically, you still get emotional abilities linked to ADHD specifically. Um, and we can measure it in real time, so we gave people monitors to go home with and um, every two hours something would buzz on their wrist and they had to fill in a little handheld computer and record how they felt at that point in time. And uh, in particular we would ask them about how angry or irritable they would feel or did they feel happy or excited. And the data basically goes up and down throughout the day, That's, it sort of happens for all of us. Um, so you can look at the average amount of um, irritability or anger, and you can also look at the variability. The standard deviation is completely hopeless because though these two distributions have the same standard deviation. So you can't use standard deviation. <laughs> um, so what you have to do is you, you take the difference from uh, one point to the next point and you just take the sum of the differences and sort of add those up and then you, you and that's a very nice measure of variability. Um, so both, you know, both the mean and the variability are independent, are significant, uh, significantly increased, and particularly for anger and irritability. And this is sort of overall what the data looks like. In the ADHD group, these darker squares are when they're reporting feeling more angry. And so you can see it's happening much more frequently. And there's also much more sort of variability going from dark to light, you know, compared to the control group. You know, many of the control group are quite sort of stable. Some of them are less stable, but um, there's, there's a big difference between the two groups. Um, and I suppose one of the reasons for, for sort of focusing on emotional ability, and this has come out from other people like Russell Barclay, also has written in this area, um, but it seems to be an independent predictor of many of the impairments in ADHD. And so um, the ones with stars are where... It, uh, mood lability is an independent predictor of family problems, school problems, school meaning sort of generally education in college, because this was an adult sample, um, life skills, and also social problems. So it's a, it's, a, so it's a major source of impairment in ADHD. But the interesting thing is that the clinical studies show equal effect size of methylphenidate and atomoxidine on these symptoms as they do on core ADHD symptoms. So it seems to be part of the condition. Um, 
And another area of epidemiology has been to look, think of ADHD as a, a kind of underlying risk factor, and particularly because you may have it from a young age. So other factors may play upon it. So it's very interesting to kind of reflect why would somebody with ADHD be much more likely to develop conduct problems later in life. And we know from these genetic studies that there are many, that there are shared gene effects. But we also know that um, conduct problems is slightly different from ADHD. There's a large fami family environment component and not just a, a genetic component. Um, and we also know that ADHD comes first and these other problems tend to develop second. So it's very likely that you've got ADHD and that there are some factors that, that mediate or, or sort of moderate these outcomes, um, particularly on something like conduct problems. And so it's very interesting to see this paper from Anita Papa's group and Caspian Moffat. Um, and what they've basically shown is in three independent samples, a very similar set of findings, where this particular genetic genotype of the COMT gene, this leads to low levels of dopamine. Um, if you have the VAL-VAL in a clinical sample of children with ADHD, you're more likely to develop conduct disorder if you have this sort of low dopamine variant of the COMT. Um, here we've got a, a population sample. This is Caspian Moffitt's work. You can see there's no effect in the general population of people without ADHD. And it's only in the group of children with ADHD where you get the same, exactly the same effect as in the clinical group. And here, this is a replication in uh, now looking at aggression in another sample. And there's actually another published sample over here, ALSFAC, which is also replicated. So these are four replications. So it's very interesting that somehow ADHD is a sort of background factor and other risk factors sort of play upon it. So it enhances your risk. It, it sort of enhances these genetic risks on the conduct disorder. Um, and my, my guess is you've got genetic effects and environmental effects and people with ADHD are particularly sensitive to these effects. So it makes complete sort of theoretical logic that if you can get in there early, you can prevent these long-term developmental problems. Um, and sort of finally, I just wanted to sort of think about sort of some of the future directions that, that we're trying to go with these sort of epidemiological studies. And, and in our work, we typically compare clinical samples with population samples. And for ADHD, that works really well, because so far, everything we've found in a clinical sample, we've replicated in a population sample. And it is, really does reflect the fact that ADHD is representing the tail of this sort of normal trait. And sort of one of the things we found in both uh, the clinical and the population sample was relating to cognitive <coughs> performance measures. And so this is actually a, a measure of reaction time. And this is a, an inhibitory measure, looking at um, uh, commission errors and, and other sorts of errors and, and we think loosely that these reflect sort of top-down control and these loosely reflect these sort of more bottom-up processes but I mean there's there's some debate as to to uh, <coughs> where these different effects come from but they, but they but they are two distinct processes and actually genetically these are unrelated so they really are two quite distinct processes and um, Research from people at Halprin suggests that they're having different effects at different ages in development. And so it may be the interaction of these top-down and bottom-up processes that predicts the long-term outcome. So um, these measures, you know, in early childhood, um, with these particular sets of measures, you have both the sort of variability measures and, and, and these sort of inhibitory um, errors. But then as you grow older, it depends if, if, you're, a, if you're a remitter um, you know, you, you basically lose these inhibitory problems. So it seems that if you've got good cortical function, you no longer have these inhibitory control problems, you're actually in control of your ADHD. You still have a, at a cognitive level, you're still impaired, you still have this persistent problem with the art, with, and that's shown up through this sort of slow variable reaction times. But actually you've, you're not symptomatic and you've got good cortical control. But the group that persists sort of have, have both of these problems. So that's why in adults these cortical processes may be particularly important in the persistent group because you're not getting any kind of um, a, a decent amount of maturation that's sort of controlling these bottom-up processes. So, so this is sort of still theoretical. I mean, we have data, but we're trying to replicate it. Um, but I think still, I think this is going to be quite a, an interesting way of thinking about things, sort of trying to understand what moderates the effects.
So if we know sort of what causes ADHD to get better, that would give us good <coughs> targets for treatment. Um, and just to show you, you can generate good biomarkers, and this is using an EEG um, task in, in the same adult sample I showed you earlier, where we did the movability work. And it's actually contrasting two conditions. Here they're just lying down resting, um, and here they're engaging in a task which is quite difficult. It's like an inhibitory con control task, and the people with ADHD make a lot of errors. Um, people with controls make much less errors. But if you look at the theta activity, you know, in the ADHD group, it actually, it doesn't, they, you know, they're not really sort of engaging in this task properly. There's no, there's no increase in brain activity. So they're not engaging their brains. That's what normally happens in a control. You know, less errors, more brain activity. Um, once you give them methylphenidate, it completely normalizes it. So one of the things we expected to find was that um, the sort of the change, um, the change um, that you get with methylphenidate should parallel the change you get in symptoms. The one should correlate with the other. But actually, that's where it all fell down. We didn't see change in one predicting change in the other. And it turns out that, um, in fact, it's very hard to actually say, uh, to identify empirical evidence of causal processes. So we know an awful lot about cognitive dysfunctions that are associated with ADHD but we know very little about which are the ones that are actually causal. And many of the impairments may actually just be associated neurodevelopmental problems in the same way you might have autism, you might have dyslexia, you know, you might have a problem in being slow in the way you respond or a problem with inhibitory responses. It's been very difficult to actually pin it down causally. And so I think at least the focus of our work is to, is to try and differentiate these two key models where you're really, what, what we're particularly interested in in terms of developing new treatments is identifying these processes that actually mediate the processes that take you from these gene effects to the clinical disorder. But, you know, in many cases, we're just going to be looking at correlated effects, but not necessarily causal effects. So it's just a, a comment on where we're going with our work. So the main summary points are, you know, ADHD is common. It's a persistent adulthood in about two-thirds of cases. Um, at least in our data, the combined type ADHD was particularly, showed a particularly high persistence rate. Um, hyperactivity impulsivity tends to decline with age. However, if you go into high-risk populations like prisons, you get very high levels of hyperactivity impulsivity. So I think when it persists, it's a particularly difficult problem to deal with, or it causes a particular high level of impairment. And that's probably why, you know, partly the emotional lability findings link in more with hyperactivity and impulsivity, and they're a very strong source of impairment. Um, genetic factors are clearly important. They play a role throughout the lifespan. Um, but ADHD is an early risk factor for developing these comorbid problems. You can think of it like somebody with high blood pressure. I mean, if it's high enough, you need to... It's not the blood pressure you're treating, it's the complications of the blood pressure. So although ADHD in itself does cause problems, it also generates other sorts of comorbidities and problems, and you want to prevent those developing. So getting in there early makes complete sense. Um, the neurobiology is complicated, although I thought David did a brilliant job of making it sound really beautiful and simple. Um, but, you know, there are these multiple neurobiological processes, and I think these top-down and bottom-up, they just interact with each other. They do have their own developmental trajectories. Um, and um, I think it, you know, it, it's going to be very challenging for us to really pinpoint these causal processes, uh, but something that we, we need to do. Um, and I suppose the bottom line is we know that the disorder is generally remains under-recognised and under-treated in adults. So, yeah, thank you. We hope you enjoy the clip. Remember to click the link below to give your feedback.